hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. I want to begin this morning by sharing an illustration from a book titled, I Once Was Blind But Now I Squint. <laughs> it's by Ken Crockett. So it goes like this. A father, son, and their donkey were traveling from one village to another. The boy walked while the man rode the donkey, and father overheard a bystander say, that's a shame. Look how that man is making that poor boy walk. Not wanting to be an object of criticism, the father and the son changed places. The boy rode the donkey while the man walked. He then heard a woman comment, look how that boy and the donkey is making that poor man walk. <laughs> So the father and the son both climbed on the, monkey, on the donkey, and as they traveled down the road, someone said, look how that man and the boy are making the poor donkey suffer. <laughs> so they both got off and walked, and people remarked, look at that stupid man and boy, they're walking when they could be riding on a donkey. <laughs> The boy was walking and the man was carrying the donkey. <laughs> have you ever had one of those things where there's just no way to please anybody? <laughs> Once the criticisms begin, goodness, there can be no end, right? You know, criticism once we begin with an object, situation, a word, a person, it could really just go out of control. It is because each criticism comes with judgment, and that judgment sets attitude, and that attitude directs us to a path that is very difficult to turn back. I am guilty of it myself. Now, criticism is not just a negative attitude. But it's also lacking filter in words, careless words that can easily hurt each other. We've all heard a statement, words can cut deeper than a knife, right? Mm -hmm. Well, this saying is based on Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18. Rash words are like sore thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. I know firsthand how criticism can hurt a person's spirit. I'm sure that I have hurt others with my judgment and I have been hurt with others' criticisms as well. No matter the intention, criticism projects judgment. And the gospel lesson this morning teaches us to be merciful as God is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. And give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap for the measure you give will be the measure you get back. This teaches us to be thoughtful in our thoughts and with words that we use. Instead of criticism, affirmation lifts people up and heals not only a person's spirit, but also relationships. According to Psychology Today, affirmations are simple statements that are designed to create self-change in the individual. <coughs> they can serve as an inspiration as well as simple reminder they also can serve to focus attention on goals throughout the day, which in of it itself has the potential to promote positive and sustained self-change. And it is in this aspect I want to lift up this morning story of, from the story of Ruth. Last week, the message was about Ruth being a blessing, giving hope to Naomi. In it, I have briefly mentioned the state Naomi must have been in as a wife and as a mother, losing the one she so dearly loved 
when she returned to her homeland, she said this in her grief. Call me no longer Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. Why call me Naomi? When the Lord has dealt harshly with me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. She was grieving so much. She wanted to change her identity. She wanted to deny and forget the period where her life was full by changing her name to Mara, which means bitter. But in the midst of her disparity, she had hope. And that was Ruth. Ruth was Naomi's blessing of hope from God. Now this morning, I want us to look at Ruth and her state. She had lost her husband. Naomi has suggested Ruth to go back to her family, which indicated Ruth had a family to go back to. The ones who could give her comfort, safety, and security. If Ruth had returned, she most likely would have found a second husband to marry pretty quickly. However, she chose to remain with her mother-in-law. Two things from this that I can conclude. First, is that Ruth truly loved Naomi and considered Naomi as her family. And second was that, although it was common for Israelites immigrate to Moab to have known to integrate and adapt Moabite <coughs> gods, Naomi must have been solid in her faith to help Ruth convert to Judaism. But as for Ruth, moving to Bethlehem couldn't have been easy. My aunt married my uncle back in the early 70s when my uncle was stationed in South Korea in the army. Afterwards, my aunt immigrated and they moved uh, and settled in Lebanon, Ohio. Back then, it was a very small town. And you know we immigrated and settled in Lebanon um, in late 70s. It was a predominantly white town with a couple of blocks at the edge of the town that were African-American neighborhood. Of course, later on, I found out that that was where the grand poopa of KKK resided. <laughs> Back to my aunt. So moving into their new home, my uncle took my aunt to the only hardware store in town to purchase a stove for their house. The store owner approached them, shook my uncle's hand. The owner and my uncle's parents were longtime friends. So what came afterward was a shock. The owner told my uncle, well, Kenneth, I'm sorry, but I cannot sell anything in this store to your chink wife. My uncle and aunt walked out of there and never returned to that store. This gives some perspective to Ruth when she came to Bethlehem with Naomi. Ruth was an immigrant to this small town. Last week's reading concluded with verse 22, which stated, so Naomi returned together with Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, who came back with her from the country of Moab. The author made it clear that Ruth was not one among Naomi's people. Let's picture the moment Naomi walked into this town with Ruth. Can you visualize people stopping whatever they're doing to stare? Can you see these two more women walking down the street, most likely tired and worn out from their travel, and hear people whispering as they pass by? Can you see the pictures of people pointing fingers? And when some approached Naomi, I wonder what their intentions were. Was it concern? Or was it just being nosy? Naomi returned knowing her and Ruth would be displaced, not having any male family members. Maybe she hoped one of her relatives would take them in, but that didn't happen. It was up to Ruth to support <coughs> Naomi. And we can conclude these things about Ruth's uh, character. First, we see Ruth's initiative to care for her mother-in-law. In verse 2, Naomi doesn't command Ruth to go out and work, 
is through a two approach and says, let me go to the field and glean among the ears, along the ears of grain. Ruth has committed herself to support Naomi. And second, we see Ruth's humility. She knows how to take initiative without being presumptuous. In verse 7, the servants report to Boaz how she had approached them that morning and said, Pray, let me glean among the sheaves after the reapers. She doesn't demand a handout. She does not presume the right even to glean. All she wants to do is gather up the leftovers after the reapers are done, and she asks permission. Third, Ruth has a great work ethics. Verse 7 continues, she has continued from early morning without resting even for a moment. And verse 17 goes on to say that she gleaned until evening and then before she quit, she beat out what she gleaned, measured it, and took it home to Naomi. She worked very hard from sunup to sundown. It couldn't have been easy. Yet Ruth did all she could to support Naomi. What Ruth needed at the time, I'm sure, was help, support, encouragement, but she most likely didn't even have a friend until Boaz came along. Boaz was a pillar of the community, literally, because his name was on the pillar of the temple. <laughs> <laughs> and who just happened to be related to Naomi's dead husband. Boaz was like, most likely noticed Ruth because she looked foreign. Once she found out, once he found out who Ruth was through his servant, he said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Keep your eyes on the field that is being reaped and follow behind them. I have ordered the young men not to bother you. If you get thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. In that instant, not only did he provide for her, but also provided, offered her safety. To a widow, this was a very generous and crucial gift. Ruth was so grateful, she fell prostrate with her face to the ground and said to him, why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me when I am a foreigner? <laughs> Now this comment really touched my heart. Beside my aunt, as I mentioned, my family was the first Asian family to immigrate and settled in Lebanon, Ohio. I knew I looked different, and I didn't speak a word of English. Other kids just didn't hesitate to point fingers, whispered, and even made fun of my eyes. And it was the first time I remember that I felt like an alien. I remember how much I missed my friends in Korea. One can't help but to lose all confidence. So when Boaz showed Ruth such kindness, Ruth didn't fully understand at the time that God's tested loving kindness. And she only felt unworthy. Not only that, Ruth was able to glean epith of barley, which is a measurement of dry goods, about 30 pounds, enough to feed her and Naomi, Naomi, and able to sell some for their income. To two widows, this was not a small gesture. This was a lifesaver. In Ruth's questions, Boaz answered her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told me and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. May the Lord reward you for your deeds and may you have a full reward from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Then she said, May I continue to find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, even though I am not one of your servants. 
Most likely, Ruth was worn out physically and mentally from working all day while no one spoke to her. And I'm sure that Boaz was the first person who reached out to her and showed her kindness, extending grace, extending God's love in Hebrew Hesed. This affirmation was what she needed to give Ruth hope. Boaz became God's blessing upon Ruth and Naomi through this simple affirmation. When a classmate invited me to her birthday party as an 11 year old, it was a huge affirmation of acceptance. A simple gesture that changed the whole attitude of a young person. A simple gesture of affirmation lifts up the spirit and heals relationships and we become blessings to each other. George Barna, founder of Christian Marketing Research Company, has studied what he called turnaround churches. Churches that had been going downhill in ministry attendance, but turned things around and started thriving. He found a variety of factors that helped these churches turn around. But the one principle that he drew from the study was that when people perform true ministry, they should be applauded. More sp specifically, he writes, a successful ministry is one in which people are recognized for their accomplishments. Not to be placed someone on a pedestal, but because human beings need to be recognized for their good works. Put in proper perspective, a bit of celebration and appreciations regarding true ministry can help maintain an active <coughs> and happy congregations. A Canadian uh, poet named William Chapman said, words cut deeper than knives, but a knife can be pulled out. The words are embedded into our souls. When we affirm each other, we are praising all God's creation. So every word we say, it ought to be of affirmation. A for example that I came across says, a young man showed up a little early for his date and when his girlfriend answered the door, her hair was teased in all 100 different directions. <laughs> and to take the awkwardness out of the situation, she said, what do you think? <laughs> The boy hesitated, and then he said, looks like it's about to become something wonderful. <laughs> In Ruth's story, God doesn't speak through burning bush to divide a sea to get the message across. Instead, God acts through the faithfulness of an ordinary human beings. This is because God's hesed, a Hebrew word for loving kindness, Grace and mercy is embodied in our own human action. As Boaz affirms Ruth for her loyalty to her mother-in-law and then enacts through his generosity the blessing of God that he caused down upon her. May the Lord reward you for your deeds and may you have a full reward from the Lord, God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to refuge. When Naomi sees the astonishing amount of barley that Ruth had gleaned and finds out that it is Boaz who had helped Ruth, it is only then that the Naomi began to move from despair to hope. She recognizes in this turn of events the hand of God that she, had, she was quick to name a source of blessing. In verse 220, she says, Blessed be the Lord by the and the kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. The hope extends through his affirmation. Through the affirmation, emptiness is being filled, hope is born, and Naomi, an old widow who has seen more than her share of sorrow, recognize the hand of God. Let us all strive to affirm each other today and every day. Amen. Amen.